uh, guests. He will give us a talk about recent uh, latest developments in the variation of the fine structure constant. So Professor Webb, I will shut down my video and my microphone. The screen is all yours, but we are here for any help. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see. Good. Just give me a sec to get to the beginning. Perfect. Okay. So I will warn you when we are left with five minutes. You have okay, more that's or less great. 50 minutes plus questions. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, let me begin. Okay, so the, uh, the title of my talk is, um, uh, or the, su the subject of my talk is um, uh, basically new measurements of, uh, of the fine structure constant at high redshift. Um, so I really want to cover just three things in this talk. One, I'm gonna give you a bit of a background about quasar measurements. Of course, there are numerous ways of uh, checking on variability of uh, fundamental constants. I'm just gonna talk about one, and that is quasar measurements. I'll give some background to the way in which these measurements are made. Then I will talk about current status, by which I mean what's in the literature and people are probably aware of, but I will summarize it. And then um, what I want to talk about, and this is being presented here for the first time, um, are the results for some really remarkable new observations that were collected recently using all four VLTs simultaneously, pointed at the same quasar to get a very, very good spectrum, unprecedented in terms of the um, resolution combination of spectral resolution and uh, particularly wavelength calibration. So it's pretty amazing data, uh, which interestingly, suggests, um, uh, it doesn't give a null result, suggests a potential variation of the fine structure constant. Of course, it's early days, and I'll talk about that in some detail in the last part of my talk, but first want to just talk about, give, give a very general background. Uh, so I won't spend a great deal of time talking about the theoretical motivations. There are many, and they've been discussed uh, very nicely in, in a large number of papers, a selection of which are shown on this slide. There are models um, that are based on coupling dark energy to the values of fundamental constants. There are models, um, quite a large number of theoretical models, which are based on um, unification um, ideas, notably um, unification ideas, as is well known, require the existence of additional compactified dimensions in which the additional dimensions beyond our normal three spatial and one time dimension are intimately related to the values of the fundamental constants and any evolution of any sort uh, to those extra dimensions would result in um, variation of the fundamental constants. There are models which involve uh, um, spatial variations, there are models which involve time variations, and there are models which uh, involve variation of the fundamental um, constants with uh, gravitational potential. So the, there's a whole literature out, out there, a, a, few, a few papers displayed on the, on the screen here, but, um, uh, but, but I, so I won't, won't spend more time on that because I really want to talk about the observations and what, what the observations seem to be telling us. <clears throat> First of all, what can we, uh, in principle, actually measure? Of course, there's a large number of constants, but not all of these can be meaningfully measured. And there's been a whole debate in the literature um, about um, whether one can meaningfully make measurements of dimensional uh, versus dimension less constants. The general, uh, um, the general consensus on that is that one should focus on dimension less dimensions. And certainly um, I would say in astrophysics, uh, it's, much, it's much easier to work on dimensionless con uh, constants. 
I, I'm focusing in this talk on just one, and, and that is the uh, strength of the electromagnetic force, the fine structure constant, the first one in this list. There are, um, there are methods of uh, studying the other quantities in this table um, using different types of observations. Um, so for example, the um, ratio of the electron to proton mass can be studied by looking at molecular lines um, in quasar spectra at a high redshift, uh, um, using combinations of radio data, 21 centimeter observations, for example, and optical observations. One can look at various combinations of constants like the fine structure constant, the uh, proton um, uh, G factor, uh, and, uh, and so forth. I'm gonna focus on the first one in the list, the fine structure constant. A great deal of observations have now been taken using both the um, VLT, um, high resolution spectroscopy on the VLT, uh, and also the Keck telescopes. There are two uh, very good um, spectrographs on both instruments, um, and there now exist many hundreds of quasar spectra that have been taken for a whole range of reasons, uh, but which can be used um, to measure the fine structure constant in numerous directions uh, in the universe and um, numerous redshifts, of course. The basic idea with um, and a shell spectrum, these are a shell spectrographs where the spectral orders are um, split up spatially onto the two-dimensional detector in the way illustrated in the top panel in this, um, the colorful one in this diagram, um, where you can see each, each band that you see going across the screen is a different spectral order and they are stacked one above each other um, in order to get lots of information onto the detector. And the dark bands that you see represent um, absorption lines in the spectrum. Uh, the colors are just purely artificial just to make it look pretty, but you can get the general idea. So you get the data in this two-dimensional format. And then from that two-dimensional format, you have to calibrate the data very, very carefully. Uh, and you end up with something that looks like the bottom panel on the screen uh, for a quasar spectrum where you, um, you can see then the spectrum of the quasar with the emission lines and, and then a whole plethora of absorption lines um, right across the spectrum. Of course, the as, as, as is well known, the line alpha forest is very dense. There are lots of lines. And so that's what you can see on the left-hand side in this particular simulated spectrum between 3,500 and about 4,800 angstroms here. And then longwards, of, uh, longwards in wavelength of the emission line, you see far fewer lines. And these are the heavy element lines in the spectrum caused by intervening galaxy halos intersecting the line of sight to the background quasar. You see a whole range of different transitions from silicon multiple ionization states, carbon, iron, magnesium, zinc, chromium. I've listed them all here uh, and there are, there are others too. So you get an incredible amount of information uh, in the one spectrum uh, about the physics of the gas uh, in the halo of the galaxy that's intersecting the line of sight to the background quasar. Um, in this cartoon here, um, what the artist has managed to nicely represent is the fact that actually the gas clouds that do intersect the line of sight are, uh, are not perfect spheres, but they're complicated they have substructure. This is going to be very important for what I'm gonna say shortly. Uh, the substructure turns out to complicate the analysis um, and it's something that one has to focus on very hard to get as right as you possibly can when you want to measure um, the effect of a changing fine structure constant on the, weight, on the observed wavelengths of the um, spectroscopic lines that you see in these galaxy halos intersecting the sight line to the background quasar. <clears throat> Some time ago, uh, we introduced something called the many multiplet method. So let me just give a little bit of a background to the many multiplet method. The um, 
many multiplet method allows one to compare the wavelengths in a set of different multiplets, could be the same species, iron two, for example, or it could be from different atomic species, from iron and magnesium uh, and silicon and zinc and chromium and so forth. It doesn't have to be uh, different, different species. It could all be the same species. But of course, you get more information if you do use different, uh, lots of different transitions from different species. The many multiple me method is based on um, uh, relativistic calculations of Hartree-Fock effect. Uh, and it essentially calculates what an electron feels in its orbit about a nucleus as a result of changing the strength of the electromagnetic force. Electrons which are closer to a high mass nucleus, then if you change the, the fine structure constant, if you change the electromagnetic force, then the impact on the um, orbit of the electron will be greater than if you have an electron about uh, in the vicinity of a low mass nucleus. This is good. This is very good because what it means is that we get a unique uh, signal of a change in the fine structure constant. If all electrons were varied in the same way, we would not be able to distinguish ordinary redshift from a change in the fine structure constant. But because of this effect, because of the different impact uh, on the uh, electron of a high mass nucleus or a low mass nucleus, and of course, on which orbit the electron is in, classically, if you like, how close the electron is to the nucleus, because of these effects, we get a, a truly unique um, fingerprint of, uh, of, a, of, a, of what a change in the fine structure constant does uh, to uh, spectral lines. This is illustrated in this diagram. Um, on the vertical axis, you can see uh, uh, it's a change in the fine structure constant. And on the horizontal axis, it's rest wavelength. And uh, there are a few transitions illustrated. Those are labeled at the top of the diagram. Um, uh, you can see a range of them. What's interesting here is that some of these transitions are uh, very insensitive to a change in, the, in alpha. So for example, if you look at magnesium two over towards the right-hand side of the diagram here, essentially magnesium two, low mass, uh, is rather insensitive to a change in the fine structure constant. Conversely, if you look at iron two over here, singly ionized iron, then this is indeed sensitive as you as you change the fine structure constant, if you change delta alpha over alpha, iron indeed changes quite substantially compared to magnesium. And uh, also to illustrate the point that I made earlier about there being a unique fingerprint, you can see the um, interesting behavior of zinc and chromium. So for a given change in the fine structure constant, chromium changes in one direction, and zinc changes in a different direction. That may be counterintuitive, but those are the results of the um, relativistic Hartree-Fock calculations, and those calculations are not controversial. They're pretty well understood. Um, the errors in those calculations are larger than one would want, um, but uh, nevertheless, the general principles are, I would say, very well understood. And so these effects that you see in this cartoon are quite, quite well uh, understood. I'm pausing because my screen isn't changing for some reason. So sorry for the pause. Right. Um, okay, so um, the methods that one uses to analyze data of this sort are crucial. And because the detectors are getting better, the calibration methods are getting better, the telescopes ultimately are, getting, are going to get much bigger, the data quality is going to be extraordinarily good ultimately when the ELT comes along, one has to think very carefully about the methods used to analyze data of this sort. The data is actually rather complex. Um, and uh, traditionally, 
um, people have sat down in front of a computer screen and tried to model these absorption uh, spectra essentially by eye. So you, you look at the data and you see where that you think that there's a component. Remember the cartoon that I showed you earlier with the substructure in the gas? Well, where, where do the absorption components arise? And these were sort of human decisions, which is not good. So very recently, uh, colleagues and I applied artificial intelligence uh, to uh, the whole problem, such that the human element is completely removed. So all the calculations now, and this is very new, um, are done on a supercomputer. It takes a supercomputer quite a while to do the calculations, but it takes the human no time at all. Um, and uh, this is good because all, all subjectivity is removed. The problem is complicated in the sense that that substructure that you saw in the cartoon earlier means that you can have many, many components across an absorption complex, which in practice means potentially several hundred free parameters in the model that you're trying to fit to the data. Um, another important consequence of that is that basically there's no unique model because you've got, and this is probably generally true in, in, in many situations, well, not probably, it is true in, in many situations where you have a, a theoretical model with a large number of free parameters uh, that you're fitting to a complex data set that you can get more than one minimum in your parameter space. And then you have to decide which one do I take? Um, I'm gonna talk about that uh, in a little bit of uh, detail and, um, the the answer to the the answer to that problem is not not particularly simple but it is a problem that can be dealt with as i'm going to explain so just to illustrate that point here's a picture then of a, a you know a, 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 of chi squared contours in uh, in for, because we're in a two on a two dimensional surface here in a two dimensional parameter space where you can see that you know, clearly, there are two minimums. This is a common problem, well known to statisticians and, and well known to many people working in astrophysics uh, that, that you have to deal with. And very, very often, there's one dominant minimum and, and, you know, and, and multiple minor minimum. But nevertheless, this is a problem because if you're a human sitting in front of a computer screen modeling your data, you don't really know where in that parameter plane that's displayed on the slide at the moment, you will end up. And so it's, a, it's an important issue. And it's been impossible to deal with this up until now because it has, just has taken so long to do the modeling of the data. Once you've got an AI method that does it all in an automated uh, manner, you can actually start to Monte Carlo the whole system, the whole modeling process, so that you can probe parameter space in large dimensions uh, many times using uh, Monte Carlo methods. That's what uh, we're now doing. This is for the first time, so it's very new, uh, so that we can seek out those secondary minima and understand those systems which have this problem more severely than others. And interestingly, it turns out that some absorption systems um, do have the problem more than others but it's actually more interesting than that. It turns out as well that the statistical tool you decide that you use to decide on your best fit models, an information criterion like the AKK information criterion, Bayesian information criterion, those also determine how bad your parameter space looks. I'll, I'll show more about this in, in a moment. So we've just written uh, a paper, you can see the date there, <clears throat> about this non-uniqueness um, problem, specifically applied to measurements of the fine structure constant high redshift. I'm not going to go into the details of that paper um, uh, too much because I want to talk about some other things, um, but um, this is a, a, a general problem. So whilst this paper is specific to quasar spectroscopy and measurements of the fine structure constant, uh, that there may be uh, some things of general interest in that paper. Um, I said earlier that because the 
data quality is improving so dramatically that in some sense one has to go back to basics and um, check that the methods that are being used uh, are good enough. And um, so there's another paper, which you can see the date there is just, um, it's actually not quite accepted. We're just undergoing refereeing with that one at the moment, uh, but it will be accepted um, shortly. Uh, where we've, we have done just, just that, and we've gone back and looked at the way, uh, this is rather specialised, the way in which the work profile is calculated, and particularly uh, the way in which derivatives of the work profile are, um, are calculated. There's a whole literature on this across many, um, many disciplines, um, not just astrophysics. The work profile, of course, is used um, for, for in, in many fields of research, and there are there's, there are hundreds of papers actually on how to calculate the Voigt profile, and uh, there are um, many 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 papers on um, approximations, analytic approximations to the Voigt profile, which is actually a numerical integral. And there are many papers on the derivatives of the Voigt profile, which are required in by nonlinear least squares methods. Uh, colleagues and I worked on this a lot recently, and um, I'm convinced that the way to do this is not to use analytic approximations, um, but to use Taylor series expansions, because with Taylor series expansions, you can actually reach um, arbitrary precision, arbitrarily high precision. And um, this turns out to be, in this context, very important. You must get the model that you're fitting correct. It must be right. And as many of the people listening will no doubt know one of the one of the major goals of the forthcoming ELT is is varying constants and another one is rich if drift so this is real time over a period of a decade uh, measurements of the change in the uh, rate of expansion of the universe uh, these these things are very challenging in terms of you know, pushing the data to the limit, and so you've got to, you've got to be very sure that you're calculating the model to its to its highest precision. For this reason, we've recently revisited those questions in that paper. Um, I didn't I didn't highlight it earlier. It appeared on an earlier slide, but the way in which we relate the observed frequency of a transition in the spectrum. This is a transition seen in this gas that intersects the line of sight towards a background quasar. So the relationship between an observed frequency and a, a laboratory frequency, one measured on Earth in the laboratory, is given by that formula at the bottom of the page. So omega z, the frequency seen in some gas cloud at some redshift z, but in the rest frame, is equal to the laboratory value plus a delta omega. And the delta omega is related, uh, this is the delta omega is caused by a change in the fine structure constant, and it's related to the fine structure constant and a redshift z, alpha z in that formula at the bottom of the screen by that, by, by that uh, parameter q. q is a sensitivity coefficient. These are the coefficients that come out of the relativistic Hartree-Fock calculations, and they are different for different atomic species. For, for magnesium, that value of Q is quite small. For uh, higher mass species, chromium, zinc, and um, iron, that parameter is larger. Uh, parameterizing the problem in this way should suggest that if alpha Z equals alpha naught, that is, if the fine structure constant does not change at all, then you simply, omega z is simply equal to omega naught. In other words, um, uncertainties in the sensitivity co coefficient q shouldn't bias the value of um, omega z um, artificially away from omega naught. That's true, but interestingly, uncertainties, it turns out, in the Q coefficient uh, do bias omega Z towards omega naught. Uh, so one has to be 
careful about that uh, in, in interpreting the measurements. It's good in the sense that you're not going to end up with a, a spurious measurement, non-zero measurement, a spurious detection of a, a apparent change in the fine structure constant if the Q coefficients are a bit wrong. But what you are going to do is you're going to tend to get a result closer to the null result caused by uncertainties in the Q coefficients. Um, and there are, there are uncertainty in those Q coefficients. Some of them are good to 10%, others are good to 20 or percent or worse. And this is basically state of the art at the moment. This is um, uh, due to technical reasons with ident identifying, being able to successfully identify um, um, levels in the, in the atomic calculations. Um, and so it's a tricky problem, actually, that, that, that uh, you know, the, the people who, who work on these calculations, my, my colleagues um, in Sydney in particular, uh, are working on, but, you know, the uncertainties in these Q coefficients are not at the 1% level. The diagram itself here just represents um, where the common transitions seen in quasar spectra fall in terms of rest wavelength. This is in the ultraviolet. These transitions are, of course, redshifted up into the optical for high redshift quasars. And the size of the circles in, in, um, in this diagram just indicate uh, the size of that Q coefficient in the formula at the bottom of the screen. And the colors indicate whether the Q coefficient is negative or positive. And of course, it's that change in sign and it's the change in magnitude which produce that kind of unique pattern that I showed you in this plot. Okay, so current status. So the second point on my early and simple slide. The current status is, is curious, actually. Um, and and I'm, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time talking about this data because I want to talk about some new data. But um, using the Keck telescope, it, it, it seemed as if alpha actually decreases uh, with increasing redshift. Using the VLT in the southern hemisphere, it seemed as if alpha actually increases with decreasing, uh, sorry, in, with increasing redshift. Um, very strange. And you might think that's a, that's a sign of systematic effects. Yes, possibly, but who knows? Um, so, and the diagram there just indicates what happens to the various transitions with those effects going on. But, but as I think probably, probably quite a few of the, of the listeners um, are aware, there is that we wrote a paper some time ago um, suggesting actually that what the data show is that there seems to be a spatial variation. Because actually, curiously, a very simple model, a cosine model, um, uh, fits the data quite well. So if you actually just fit uh, a simple function to the data of the sort that's in the top right-hand corner of the screen, then um, it, it seems to give a kind of coherent pattern across the sky in the sense that um, if you get the best fit direction for a dipole model uh, and vertical scale here is delta alpha over alpha in units of 10 to the minus five, then the data binned up uh, look like this. They actually fit the cosine model tolerably, tolerably well. Um, Rather strange though, fine structure constant varies differently in one direction compared to the uh, complete opposite direction. But nevertheless, that's what the data say. And the data, the data are quite extensive. There's a total of several hundred measurements now. Um, and interestingly, independently, if you search or solve for this apparent preferred direction, independently using the VLT and the Keck data, they, they do actually both point in the same direction on the sky with fairly large errors 
as you can see in this diagram here, the blue um, contour there shows you where the VLT data point, the Keck data green, remember with an opposite sign, happen to point in the same direction. And then, uh, uh, so, so that's, a, that's an interesting coincidence. Of course, we've done statistics on the probability of getting, getting that and um, the probability isn't terribly small, um, but nevertheless, it's an effect which is there in the data. The effect is also, also increases in both samples with uh, redshift, the, uh, there is a, a much smaller effect, lower redshift than there is a larger redshift. Um, if you take this apparent preferred direction and you, uh, you, you, you project all of the um, measurements across the sky, you, you effectively project the values uh, geometrically onto a single sight line, uh, then you can actually plot on the x-axis r cos theta. So this is effectively, it's in giga light years, it's just a distance along a single sight line through the universe, a single axis through, through the universe. And then on the uh, y-axis here, it's delta alpha over alpha. And uh, if, if there were no spatial, there, no spatial preference, then those points should all sit on zero but they actually rather nicely fit on a, um, a straight line. Again, suggesting that, that there's some kind of spatial effect going on. Um, do I believe this? I don't believe it. I don't disbelieve it. I have a completely open mind about this. This is what the data say. There's been a huge effort to um, identify systematics. No systematics have been put forward yet which explain this effect. That's the, that's the status, that's the current status. Um, it, it can't be one systematic. You'd have to have different systematics in two directions. Uh, and people have tried, we've tried, other teams have tried to uh, explain this in terms of um, wavelength distortions that are not understood in the spectrographs uh, and other things. And um, and, and this has been done quantitatively. There are papers about it, and um, we have not, we nor anybody else, have managed to explain this in terms of systematics yet. It doesn't mean to say that there aren't other systematics present in the data that we just haven't found, of course, but, but that's the situation at the moment. So what I want to talk about now is just to go into a little bit more detail about modeling the data. And I, I've, I've chosen this particular topic to um, talk about because I think, I think it's of general interest to anybody who's got a complex data set that you're trying to fit a model with many parameters to. So often in astrophysics, I think the statisticians in general are, are a bit ahead of us in astrophysics um, because in astrophysics, very often people just use chi-squared and if they get a chi-squared, a normalized chi-squared of, of order unity, they're kind of happy with the result and, and present that as, as, um, as a, a good model that represents the data. And that's, that's true, but, it, but more care is needed than that. And so for that reason, and, and I'm sure many people here already know about this, um, there are things called information criteria. And the two famous ones, are the AKK information criterion, or um, more commonly used, the corrected version of that, and the Bayesian information criterion. So the AICC and the BIC. These st statistics take the general form given by the top equation there, which just says IC equals chi-squared, the ordinary chi-squared, which, which depends upon the number of data points you've got, and it depends upon the number of um, free parameters in your model, because chi-squared, of course, is the squared, some of the squared residuals between the theoretical model and the data, plus a penalty term, which is the P, the second term in that first equation here. So there's a penalty term here. And the, the two famous information criteria, AICC and BIC, quantify this penalty term in different ways. 
Again, all of this is well known, well discussed in the statistical literature. Um, just to go through the diagrams to illustrate the point, perhaps emphasize things even more clearly. Suppose you have a set of data points like these hollow circles here, look something like that, and you want to fit a theoretical model to those data points, but you're not quite sure how many parameters you should be using because the theoretical model isn't uniquely defined. In some problems it is, in other problems it isn't. In our problem, it isn't. Um, because of that complexity in the gas illustrated in that early cartoon. So do you fit, for example, a parabola? Well, maybe not. Do you fit that purple line? Maybe not. There's probably two parameters in there, too many parameters. Do you fit the yellow line? Yes, possibly. But how do you decide? What do you use to decide on how many um, free parameters to use in the model that you're fitting? Well, this is what you do. So you use the information criterion. Here again on the right-hand side at the top of the top, sorry, top of the diagram, uh, it just illustrates this problem, again, going back to that cartoon that illustrates the complexity in the absorbing gas, you know, represented by just putting in a, you know, a number of a number of spheres here, uh, different, different clouds, if you like, intersecting the sight line. We need to know, we need to know what theoretical model to fit to the data. And we need to do that objectively, not subjectively. And we don't want to do it by human decision. We want it to be done by a computer. Uh, and so the AICC and the BIC enable you to do that. Um, these things, these information criteria, follow this general principle of parsim parsimony. <clears throat> it sounds rather grand, it's not. Um, and this diagram that you see in the bottom right hand part of the screen, very commonly seen, many of you will have seen it before, uh, which illustrates the point. But what you want to do is you, you want to strike that balance between underfitting the data with too simple a model, like the straight line in blue, and overfitting the data with too complex a model, too many free parameters, probably like the purple curve here. You want to strike that balance and end up somewhere in the middle. This diagram, which is very, very commonly displayed in <clears throat> many talks and many articles, actually, is wrong in, in principle, actually, because um, this on, on the left hand um, axis, it's bias squared on the parameters. On the right hand side, it's variance on the parameters. Concept being that as you as you put in more and more uh, free parameters and you overfit, you increase your your free parameters become less certain. So the variance in them increases. Yes, that's true. Uh, and then uh, for the underfitting case, um, that the bias, if you're fitting far too few number of parameters to the model, then the bias on the parameters that you're using is huge. That's also true. But in fact, actually, when you think about it, these curves just don't asymptote to, to zero on the other end. They actually go through, a, both of these curves go through a minimum. So really this diagram, I would say is wrong in principle. Uh, and, and, and they're really sort of almost two parabolas which overlap. And you're looking for the, the part in the middle where you basically minimize the combination of bias on the parameters that you're trying to fit and the variance on, on the parameters you're trying to fit. I'll come back to this point uh, again in a minute. This is just, just a comment on that diagram, really, and a, and a comment on the way in which this problem is, is often portrayed in the literature. But a more important comment that I want to make is the following. And um, perhaps as others who are listening have thought about this as well. If you look at the AICC and you look at the penalty term, or you look at the BIC and you look at the penalty term, they're very simple functions, depend only on the number of parameters and the number of data points. But actually, is that good enough? Because there really is a fundamental problem because the only thing that's taken into account here, apart from the number of data points, is the number of parameters and not how important those parameters are. You may have a parameter which, uh, to which the model is very sensitive, and you may have a parameter which the model is very insensitive. And these information criteria do not take that into account at all. So I would say there's a fundamental problem with uh, the AICC and the BIC. They both weight 
unimportant parameters and uh, uh, important parameters equally. So just to illustrate that problem further, if you look at the top, the, so these are, this is real data in a, a system that I'm gonna talk about in the last, shortly, uh, in the last part of my talk. Uh, and these are different atomic transitions. This is aluminium, um, singly ionized aluminium, singly ionized silicon, something else at the top. But the point here is, if you look here, of course, this substructure in the data is clearly more important than the one um, encased within the smaller kind of rectangle over here, which is far less important. But the parameters defining those two components in the data are equally weighted in AICC and BIC. <clears throat> For that reason, we recently, this is a, a very new paper as well, and it goes into the details, the technical details to this, which I will not go into now in this talk, but it actually basically comes up with a different penalty parameter, which you see <clears throat> in the uh, equation at the bottom of the screen. Of course, it's more complicated, uh, and I'm not going to define these terms. I just want really to highlight the existence of this paper. This paper has been written, and this new information criterion, which we call SPIC for spectroscopic information, information criterion, uh, it's been, this is, a, this is specific to spectroscopy, but you could apply this same general idea in other modeling situations. The point now is that this penalty term, sorry, this penalty term uh, on the right-hand side of this equation now takes into account the number of free parameters, the number of data points, but also the relative importance of each free parameter um, in generating the theoretical model. That's the point I wanted to get across. <clears throat> this is actually goes back to that um, principle of parsimony cartoon that was a couple of slides ago, uh, but this is a real one. So this is just one realization of some modeling to a quasar spectrum. And therefore these curves are rather noisy. Of course, one can Monte Carlo it and um, get smoother curves, but this was to illustrate a point. Um, but this is basically the same plot that I showed you earlier, number of model parameters uh, and um, the two curves are as before the bias and the uh, variance on the free parameters in the model defined in a particular way. And again, I'll, I'll skip the technical details of that, but it's kind of in this region here where you're minimizing simultaneously both of those quantities that you want you want to be, and and that is what that equation does um, in a reproducible and an objective way. <clears throat> okay, now I want to <clears throat> talk about in the last um, fifteen minutes uh some astonishing new data that we've recently obtained um of course what i told you about earlier and the apparent uh, spatial variation this has to be checked of course uh and it's 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 not going to be quick doing this this is one of the tasks that the elt will carry out and it's one of the tasks hopefully that the the espresso, espresso spectrograph on the vlt before the elt gets going will also check on very carefully so as a first step along that route, we, we got some astonishing data recently. Um, we pointed all four VLTs to one quasar on the sky, and we integrated on that quasar with all four VLTs, and the VLTs were connected via optical fiber to feed the espresso spectrograph. And uh, we got some absolutely, everything just happened to work on the three nights that we were using the, the system like this, uh, everything, and, and that's no mean feat, actually. So um, it was, we were, we were lucky, uh, but we got really, really good data. Spectral resolution, um, for those of you who, you who are familiar with the term, it's about 115,000. So lambda over delta lambda is 115,000, where delta lambda is the full width half maximum of spectroscopic transition. Signal noise about 50, but these are very small pixels in wavelength. 115,000 is about two to three, two and a half times better 
uh, in resolution than the data that was used for the spatial variation measurement that I that I summarized earlier. So this is really, oh, uh, and the other thing I should say about this data <coughs> is the calibration. The calibration, uh, the, the wavelength calibration of these spectra that was carried out using laser frequency combs, fabri Perot devices, and thorium argon. So effectively, the wavelength calibration in this data is perfect. It's any uncertainties in the wavelength calibration are very, very far below uncertainties caused by other things uh, in measurements of the fine structure constant. So we do not have to worry about wavelength calibration. That's new. Wavelength calibration was um, was a problem in in is a problem in all of the <coughs> excuse me archival data that uh, has been analyzed before. Um, so there's a frequency comb. These things, when they work, are fantastic because they impose um, a grid um, of uh, emission, very narrow, unresolved emission lines on the spectrum uh, that you take using the same optical uh, setup uh, as you do the quasar data, and you can calibrate your data down to, um, for those of you who are familiar with the numbers, centimeter per second levels. So it's, it, they're, they're fantastic devices. There are problems um, with, with getting them to be consistent, but um, everything worked for us in taking this data. <coughs> Excuse me. This is just a picture of the spectrum. Quasar is called J2123 minus 0050, and that's, this just shows the, uh, the strong lime and alpha emission line, various other emission lines along the spectrum, silicon four, carbon four, and some weak emission lines in here. The lime and alpha forest over on the left-hand side, heavy element transitions over on the right-hand side, and it's these heavy element, heavy element transitions we're interested in. There is a sub-DLA, a lowish column density damped Lyman alpha absorption system caused by a galaxy closer to the line of sight than, than weaker systems and therefore giving rise to a lot of heavy element transitions and those are the things of course we targeted for a measurement of fine structure constant. Let me give you an indication of what sort of shifts we're really looking for in data of this sort when we're trying to measure a variation of the fine structure constant. This is challenging work. So if it, on the left-hand side, here is um, uh, an illustration using a simulation of a fractional change in the fine structure constant of minus two times 10 to the minus five. Uh, and the data were generated with that value. Uh, and so you can see that the normalized Residuals that sit above the uh, data in each case are very, very good. They're generally within one sigma as, well, as what they behave as will be expected. The tick marks show the positions of absorption components in this complex, sorry, uh, for three transitions. The Q coefficients in that formula I showed you earlier are illustrated for iron, quite large. Um, silicon and aluminium quite uh, small. And then if you go to the uh, right-hand uh, side, this then just illustrates uh, what, what one would see for a shift of plus two times 10 to the minus five. So if you look carefully, you can see that the, um, that the model is shifted relative to the data a little bit. And you can see this, sorry, you can see this in the normalized residuals pretty, pretty clearly, notably in the iron, because the iron shifts much more strongly, as I said, than the other transitions. So, and that's for, so that shift is basically four times 10 to the minus five. So bear that number in mind. This is real but, data. And, Webb, yes. Do you have, do you have five minutes now? Okay, thank you. I'm I'm nearing the end, so it's the timing is good. Thank you. Uh, so this is um, this is real data. Um, these are the different transitions. The vertical uh, dashed lines indicate where all the components go. The 
the absorption complex is, is extensive in this system. It was chosen for that region and we've isolated uh, segments of the spectrum to, to analyze. This is called region one. I'm gonna show you two regions. The, the model fits the data extremely well. Here's the other region, region two, I'm not gonna show you for various reasons. It's, it, it gives an inaccurate result. The data aren't, um, the character, the properties of the absorption system don't return uh, an accurate so it's uninteresting. But these two regions do, they've got strong transitions in many um, of the species, and you can see in all cases the normalized residuals, uh, they look pretty good. The model was all, this was all fitted on a supercomputer using AI uh, methods. And um, this is my last slide actually. So, um, uh, but there's quite a bit of information on it. Uh, just some technical details. When modeling data of this sort, it, as I've said repeatedly, it is challenging. Uh, you have to make sure that you do the modeling correctly. The instrumental profile, that is the profile that the instrument itself imposes on the data because of the optics and, and other things has to be fully understood. It's in, in previous measurements, always been assumed to be a Gaussian because it is close to a Gaussian, but actually now with the laser frequency comb measurements, we can measure it very well. And in reality, it looks more like this function in the lower right panel here, which is represented by a triple Gaussian. So we've modeled the data using this triple Gaussian. We've also modeled the data using a single Gaussian, which we know to be only a good approximation. But, but, but we know that the triple Gaussian is a much better approximation to the instrumental profile. And on the two left panels here, <clears throat> only for region one, this is delta alpha over alpha, fractional change in the fine structure constant, as a function of SPIC, that spectroscopic information criterion. Interestingly, very interestingly, but I haven't had time to talk about this, you get different um, distributions of points in parameter space, different um, supplementary minima with AICC and BIC and SPIC. It's, curious, it's really interesting. It's un we understand this. I can't go into the details of that, but SPIC works very well. And what you see here basically is that there's little to no non-uniqueness. Each blue point in, these, in this diagram is a different AI realization of a model fit to the data. So the model was constructed differently in each case. It's, it's as if we had you know, 25 human beings, each one doing it, and then we compare their models afterwards. That's exactly what is going on here. Uh, and you get quite consistent results depending whether you use a single Gaussian or a triple Gaussian. Here are, the, uh, here are the results. And this is what's kind of spectacular, I suppose. Um, the, the two values for delta alpha over alpha are given by these numbers here, minus 1.94 times 10 to the minus five, with a, an uncertainty around about four times 10 to the minus six, and minus 1.7 um, uh, times 10 to the minus five, plus or minus a four, taking into account systematics, taking into account uh, contrib multiple contributions to uncertainty, which I, I can't, uh, which I, I, I won't go through in any further detail because of lack of time, but uh, the overall result is a five C, five, it's a more than five sigma departure from zero. This is the first time that <clears throat> such a thing has been seen. Is it right? I don't know but this is a step along the path to finding out whether it is right or whether it isn't. Uh, I'd expected this to return zero. It doesn't return zero. Remember what I said, but interestingly, the wavelength calibration here is, a, is effectively perfect. So more data like this is really needed to see what, what is truly going on. Um, are these results consistent with um, previous measurements? Um, probably not. Um, which may imply spatial variations in the fine structure constant. There are theoretical models which predict such things. Uh, so, uh, you know, does this support 
uh, large scale spatial variation of the sort that I showed you earlier? No, it doesn't because it's a single measurement along one line of sight. We have little information. Uh, but is it consistent with that previous spatial variation? Probably not. So if this turns out to be correct, it will indicate variations in place to place um, of a fine structure constant throughout the universe. Very small variations, only at the 10 to the minus 5 level. Uh, so that's the result that we've got. To recap, I'm not, I'm just to make sure that, 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 that you, you all understand me. I, I wouldn't want to claim this as a definitive result, of course, but it's interesting. We've done the best that we can with the modeling. The data is absolutely fantastic, um, and it's a non zero result. We need to do many more measurements and see whether this is spurious or whether we will find similar things uh, with, other, with other quasar spectra. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, now we have a few minutes for questions. I, I have one question. So I understand that these results are not yet published. Or That's right. Then, okay. That's right. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we wait for someone to ask questions. I have a couple. Uh, can you show again the slide where there was uh, this uh, Q, uh, uh, Q factor versus uh, the rest frame wavelength? Because probably I miss something, but I didn't understand. On. Yes, this one, yes. <clears throat> so you say the size of the circles are related to the, um, um, to the, to the, to the value of Q, right? Yeah, yeah. That's okay. right. So I, I, I don't understand what is plotted then on the vertical axis. I mean, this Q, small Q is the oh, same capital you're, Q. Right? Then? You're quite, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you know, I've told you wrong. The, the vertical axis does indeed give you uh, the, the value of the Q coefficient. These, uh, I think these are, um, let me just, uh, I think these are the number. It's the, the total number in the, whole sample, it's the total number okay. of transitions, which, uh, apologize for that mistake, total number right. of transitions which, which, uh, in, uh, for which that particular species has been detected. Okay, so okay. also the, the scatter is due to the observational errors, right? The scatter of circles in the, because I can see there are quite two regions, low redshift, high redshift, and yeah. then the scatter of the circles is due to the observational errors. Um, not so much observational errors. Uh, <clears throat> some some things are detected more readily than others. So, okay. uh, so for example, magnesium is very very commonly detected. So uh, actually, so magnesium's magnesium is a doublet. There's it's 20, magnesium. Two is a doublet, 2796, 2803. That's very, very commonly seen. Um, there's a magnesium one line, which is less commonly seen. So this little group up here uh, represent those three magnesium transitions. The magnesium one is less commonly seen, so it's got a smaller circle. The magnesium two, 2793 and 2803 transitions are always seen together, so they've got the same size but they're right. slightly different in wavelength, so they're offset very slightly in okay. the next direction. And, and then the very last, maybe, is a naive question. But the, this empty region in between, let's say around 2,000 to 2,200 yeah. in the wavelength, is yeah. physical or is just effect of the visualization, the visualization you used to show the data? Oh. No, it's physical. So it's just, it's just, this is just oh, a way that transitions are distributed in, in rest wavelength. It's what nature does. Okay. Yeah. So I can see uh, one question, Sebastian. Okay, thanks. I would like to ask John if they have already thought about the quantum field theory point of view of the variation of alpha. If Are the data. To... Sorry. Sorry, carry on. Carry on. Yeah. I mean, in, if I think about alpha, I, I think about a, a running coupling constant, and then I would expect a negative change in alpha. Do you have any 
specifics to expect a positive change or do you yeah well you... the yeah so i mean the you know the, the the concept of running coupling constants generally is thought to be in, insignificant at these redshifts that that those those effects apply in the very <clears throat> early universe i think so these would be um you know what's the physical significance if this is found to be to be right i mean the real answer is we don't know but the, but the for example, if if, um, if you couple alpha to dark energy, and if there are spatial fluctu fluctuations in dark energy, then you may see spatial fluctuations in alpha. For example, so there are a whole there are a whole set of models of that sort. Okay. Um, yeah. So John, John Barrow, John Barrow, um, the late John Barrow, wrote quite a, a bit about um, you know the theoretical models of, of that sort. Jaume Guijo has also done, but but many other people have as well. And on my early slide, um, you know, I put some of the some of the papers describing those models. But spatial fluctuations, I suppose, you know, are common. You know, one of the common types of models would be fluctuate dark matter fluct dark dark energy fluctuations. Sorry. Uh, uh, where where alpha is coupled to the dark energy. Uh, one very last and fast question from Fabian. Uh, hello, yeah, very fast. And thank you for your talk, first of all, which is very illuminating. Uh, we can understand, or can we also understand the fluctuate, or what we understand fluctuations in alpha as fluctuations in H bar, for example? Yeah, so there are papers on that, um, and there's an interesting debate in the literature, uh, I think of the authors in a second, as to whether, whether it's meaningful to talk about, um, whether it's meaningful to attribute uh, a variation in alpha to, to a variation in a dimension, dimension L constant. Um, and I suppose the general consensus is that it's not, but I know there are papers on H bar and there are papers on um, C and there are papers on big G, but generally these things always have to be parameterized in such a way to be dimensionless. So it's got to be C dot over C or G dot over G and so forth. So anything involving H bar would have to be done similarly. Um, in, could it be H bar in, you know, it, could it be variations in H bar that, cause this. No, I don't think so, because these are atomic transitions. And, and they're, they're actually very, in that sense, they're kind of very attractive to use, because they're simple. And, and, uh, and so that parameter Q, uh, whilst, the, whilst the, uh, the calculation is quite complicated, um, never, I mean, the physics is quite complicated. Nevertheless, the, the things that it depends on are and not, not huge, and um, you know, it really just depends on alpha. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, yes, you did. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so I will thank again Professor Webb for his talk, and uh, I want to remind you that now we have a break, so we will connect again. Uh, I,